Welcome back everyone to the second part of our blockchain deep dive. I'm your host Max and I'm absolutely thrilled to have you joining me today as we continue our exploration into the captivating universe of blockchain technology. If you're tuning in for the first time, let me quickly catch you up. In our previous episode, we journeyed through the prehistory of blockchain, delving into the historical challenges of inventing digital money. We examined pioneering ideas such as David Chom's innovative eCash system, Adam Back's groundbreaking Hashcash with its proof of work concept, and the foundational principles of cryptographic chaining that ultimately set the stage for the birth of Bitcoin. If you haven't caught that episode yet, I strongly encourage you to pause here and check it out. It's linked right in the description below and it provides essential context that will make today's discussion even more rewarding. Now, building on that solid foundation, today we're shifting gears to really get our hands dirty with the technical inner workings of blockchain with a particular spotlight on Bitcoin's mechanics. Don't let the word technical intimidate you. If you're not a programmer or a computer science expert, that's perfectly okay. I promise to break everything down into bite-sized digestible pieces using everyday analogies, relatable real-world examples, and step-by-step -step explanations that anyone can follow. My goal is to make this accessible, engaging, and fun, so whether you're a complete beginner dipping your toes into crypto for the first time, a hobbyist who's dabbled in buying some Bitcoin, or even a seasoned enthusiast looking to deepen your understanding, there's something here for you. By the time we wrap up this video, you'll have a crystal clear grasp of the fundamental components that make up a blockchain, how Bitcoin leverages advanced cryptography to maintain unbreakable security, and exactly what those mysterious miners are up to when they're said to be mining Bitcoin. We'll also unpack how blockchain achieves trust and consensus without relying on any central authority like a bank or government, and I'll address some of the most common myths and misconceptions that often confuse people about this revolutionary technology. Plus, we'll touch on the broader implications, including environmental concerns, Concerns, scalability challenges, and glimpses into future developments. So, settle in with your favorite beverage, perhaps a notebook for jotting down those aha moments, and let's embark on this in-depth adventure into the heart of blockchain. To kick things off, let's do a quick refresher on what we covered last time, just to ensure we're all on the same page. At its essence, blockchain is a decentralized digital ledger, a tamper-resistant record-keeping system that's distributed across thousands or even millions of computers worldwide, known as nodes. Picture it as an enormous shared spreadsheet or notebook where every participant has an identical copy and each entry is protected by layers of mathematical safeguards. No single entity can alter the records without detection and there's no need for a trusted intermediary to oversee operations. This design makes blockchain extraordinarily powerful for applications far beyond just cryptocurrencies, such as verifying supply chains, securing medical records, authenticating digital art through NFTs, or even facilitating transparent voting systems. Bitcoin, as the pioneering and most renowned blockchain implementation embodies these principles to create a form of digital money that aligns perfectly with the key characteristics of effective currency we discussed previously. Durability. It can't be easily destroyed or corrupted. Portability. Send it anywhere instantly via the internet. Divisibility. Breakable into tiny fractions like Satoshi's. Uniformity. Every unit is identical and interchangeable. Scarcity. A fixed supply cap of 21 million coins. And acceptability. Growing adoption by individuals, businesses, and even governments. But how does all this magic happen behind the scenes? To truly appreciate it, we need to dissect blockchain into its core building blocks. The individual blocks themselves, the chaining mechanism that links them together, and the consensus protocol that ensures the entire network stays synchronized and honest. Let's begin with the basics. What exactly is a block in blockchain? Think of a block as a single page in our metaphorical shared notebook, or perhaps a container holding a batch of information. In Bitcoin's case, each block primarily stores a collection of transactions. Entries like Alice transfers 0.5 Bitcoin to Bob for a new gadget or Charlie pays 0.01 Bitcoin to Dana for a subscription service. But it's not just a random list. A block is meticulously structured with several critical elements. First, there's the header, which includes a timestamp marking when the block was created, a version number indicating the protocol rules in use, and a unique identifier called a hash that serves as the block's digital fingerprint. This hash is generated using a cryptographic function. In Bitcoin, it's SHA-256, which stands for Secure Hash Algorithm 256-bit. SHA-256 takes all the data in the block and compresses it into a fixed length string of 64 hexadecimal characters, something like yo, 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 abc, 123, d with many more digits. The beauty of hashing is its one-way nature. It's easy to compute a hash from data, but virtually impossible to reverse engineer the original data from the hash. Moreover, even the slightest alteration in the input, say, changing a single digit in a transaction amount, produces an entirely different hash output. This property is what makes blocks tamper evident. Any meddling would invalidate the hash and alert the network. 
In addition to the transaction list and header, each block contains a reference to the previous block's hash, which is how the chain forms. We'll dive deeper into that shortly. Blocks also include something called a Merkle root, which is essentially a hashed summary of all the transactions in the block. Imagine the transactions as leaves on a tree. They're paired and hashed together repeatedly until you get a single root hash at the top. This Merkle tree structure allows for efficient verification. If you want to check a specific transaction without downloading the entire block, you can just verify the path from that transaction up to the root. It's a clever optimization that saves bandwidth width and time, especially as blockchains grow massive over years of operation. Now about the size and timing of these blocks, in Bitcoin each block is capped at around 1 megabyte, though with upgrades like SegWit effective capacity can be higher for certain transaction types. This limit prevents the blockchain from bloating too quickly, ensuring that even average computers can store and validate the entire history. Blocks are produced on a schedule. Bitcoin aims for one every 10 minutes on average. Why 10 minutes? It's a balance too short, and the network might fork chaotically with overlapping blocks, too long, and transactions would confirm too slowly for practical use. This interval allows time for blocks to propagate across the global network, reducing the risk of inconsistencies. Moving on to the chain aspect. As I hinted, blockchain gets its name from the way blocks are linked in an unbreakable sequence. Each new block incorporates the hash of the preceding block in its own header. This creates a chronological chain where every block depends on all those before it, stretching back to the very first block known as the Genesis block. Satoshi Nakamoto famously embedded a message in Bitcoin's Genesis block. The Times 03 Jan 2009 Chancellor on brink of second bailout for banks, a nod to the 2008 financial crisis that inspired Bitcoin's creation as an alternative to flow centralized systems. This chaining mechanism is the backbone of blockchain's immutability. To illustrate, suppose a malicious actor wants to alter a transaction in block number 100, say to steal some bitcoin, they'd have to recalculate the hash for block 100, but that would change its hash in validating block 101, which references it. So they'd need to rehash block 101, then 102, and so on, all the way to the current tip of the chain, potentially millions of blocks. And remember, each hash requires solving a computationally intensive puzzle, which we'll cover next. This exponential difficulty makes retroactive changes prohibitively expensive and detectable, ensuring the ledger's integrity. But how are these blocks actually created and added to the chain? Who gets to decide which transactions make it into a block, and how do we prevent chaos in a decentralized system where anyone can participate? This is where the consensus mechanism shines, and for Bitcoin it's proof of work, POW. Proof of work is the ingenious solution that turns computational effort into a security guarantee. Miners, specialized computers or networks of them, compete to solve a cryptographic puzzle to earn the right to propose the next block. Let's demystify this puzzle with a relatable analogy. Imagine a massive lottery where participants must guess a number that, when combined with the block's data, transactions timestamp, previous hash, etc., produces a hash starting with a specific number of leading zeros, say 20 zeros for Bitcoin's current difficulty. Miners use trial and error, tweaking a variable called the nonce, number used once, and hashing repeatedly until they hit the target. It's like brute forcing a combination lock with billions of possibilities. The average miner might try quadrillions of combinations per second using ASICs, application-specific integrated circuits, ultra-efficient hardware designed solely for hashing. The difficulty of this puzzle adjusts dynamically every 2016 blocks, about two weeks, based on the total network hash rate. The combined computing power of all miners. If more miners join, making blocks too fast, difficulty increases to maintain the 10-minute average. Conversely, if miners drop off, perhaps due to high electricity costs, it decreases. This self-regulating system keeps the blockchain ticking steadily. The first miner to solve the puzzle broadcasts their block to the network. Other nodes quickly verify it. Check the hash, meets the difficulty target, ensure transactions are valid, no double spends, sufficient balances, proper signatures, and confirm it builds on the longest chain. If verified, the block is accepted, and the miner receives two rewards. The block subsidy, newly minted Bitcoin, currently 3.125 BTC per block, halving every 210,000 blocks or about four years, until the 21 million cap is reached around 2140, and transaction fees, voluntary tips from users to prioritize their transactions during congestion. These incentives are crucial. They motivate miners to behave honestly, as cheating, like including invalid transactions, would lead to rejection and wasted effort. Economically, it's more profitable to play by the rules. This proof-of-work consensus not only secures the network but also resolves potential conflicts, like when two miners solve blocks almost simultaneously, creating temporary forks. The network follows the longest chain rule. The chain with the most accumulated proof-of-work, i.e., the most blocks, is considered canonical. Orphaned blocks from shorter forks are discarded, and their transactions re-enter the mempool, memory pool of pending transactions, for inclusion in future blocks. This probabilistic finality means transactions become increasingly irreversible as more blocks are added on top. Typically, six confirmations, about an hour, are deemed secure for high-value transfers.
Diving deeper into the cryptography that underpins all this, Bitcoin relies heavily on two pillars, hashing, which we've covered, and asymmetric cryptography for digital signatures. Every Bitcoin user controls a wallet with a private key, a secret, random, 256-bit number, and a corresponding public key, derived mathematically from the private key. Your Bitcoin address is essentially a hashed version of the public key, like a bank account number. When initiating a transaction, you specify inputs, previous transactions where you received Bitcoin, proving ownership, outputs, new recipients and amounts, plus changes back to yourself and sign the whole thing with your private key using the elliptic curve digital signature algorithm ECDSA. This signature proves you authorize the spend without revealing the private key. Nodes verify it using your public key. If the math checks out, the transaction is valid. It's akin to a tamper-proof digital seal, forge-proof and non-repudiable. This setup elegantly solves the double spend dilemma from our prehistory discussion. Recall Alice attempting to spend the same Bitcoin twice. In Bitcoin, her first transaction to Bob is broadcast, validated and mined into a block. The block the blockchain now records that UTXO unspent transaction output as spent. If she tries a conflicting transaction to Carol, nodes will reject it during validation, as the input is already consumed. Even if she mines her own fork, the network will favor the longest legitimate chain, orphaning her attempt unless she controls over 50% of the hash rate, a 51% attack. Speaking of attacks, let's address security head-on. A 51% attack theoretically allows an attacker with majority hash power to double spend by rewriting recent history, e.g. spend Bitcoin on an exchange, withdraw fiat, then revert the chain to reclaim the coins. However, it's extraordinarily costly. Bitcoin's hash rate in 2025 exceeds 600 exahashes per second, that's 600 quintillion hashes, requiring hardware investments in the billions and ongoing electricity bills rivaling small nations. Successful attacks would erode trust, crashing Bitcoin value and rendering stolen gains worthless. Real-world examples like minor attacks on smaller chains highlight the risk, but Bitcoin's scale makes it resilient. Other threats include Sybil attacks, flooding the network with fake nodes, but Bitcoin mitigates this by weighting decisions by proof of work, not node count. DDoS attacks on miners are possible but temporary, as the decentralized network reroutes. Quantum computing poses a future risk to ECDSA, but upgrades like post-quantum signatures are in development. Overall, Bitcoin security stems from economic game theory. Attackers lose more than they gain. Now, let's tackle some misconceptions. First, Bitcoin isn't truly anonymous, it's pseudonymous. Transactions are public on the blockchain, linked by addresses. Chain analysis firms like Chainalysis can trace flows using heuristics, e.g. common spending patterns, and off-chain data, e.g. exchange KYC. For privacy, users employ techniques like coin join, mixing transactions, or switch to privacy coins like Monero. Second, mining isn't wasteful per se. While energy intensive, Bitcoin uses 150 dollars tabuot annually, comparable to Argentina. Much comes from renewables or stranded energy, e.g. excess hydroelectric in remote areas. Innovations like merged mining and layer 2 solutions reduce footprint. Third, Bitcoin isn't infinitely scalable. Its 1 nitabyte blocks limit throughput to 7 transactions per second versus Visa's thousands. Solutions include the Lightning Network, off-chain payment channels for instant, cheap microtransactions, and sidechains. Ethereum, which we'll explore later, uses proof-of-stake, POS, for efficiency, but Bitcoin sticks to POW for proven security. To bring it all together, let's simulate a transaction end-to-end. -end. Alice, with 1 BTC from a prior UTXO, wants to send 0.7 BTC to Bob. In her wallet, software like Electrum or hardware like Ledger, she inputs Bob's address, amount and a fee, say 0.0001 BTC to incentivize miners. The wallet constructs the transaction, inputs her UTXO, outputs 0.7 to Bob, 0.2999 change to herself, and signs it. Broadcast to the network, it enters mempools. A miner in includes it in a candidate block, solves the POW puzzle after comma 10 minutes of hashing and broadcasts the solved block. Nodes validate and propagate. After a few confirmations, Bob sees the funds. Immutable, borderless, permissionless. Bitcoin's brilliance extends philosophically. It democratizes money, empowering individuals over institutions. No bailouts, no inflation at whim. Code is law, yet it demands responsibility. Lose your private key and your Bitcoin is gone forever. An estimated 20% of supply is lost. Wallets emphasize backups and security. Looking ahead, blockchain evolves rapidly. Ethereum introduces smart contracts, self-executing code for DeFi, decentralized finance, DIOs, autonomous organizations, and NFTs. Other chains like Solana prioritize speed, Cardano research-driven design, interoperability projects like Polkadot connect ecosystems. Real-world adoption grows. El Salvador uses Bitcoin as legal tender. Major firms like Tesla hold it. CBDCs, central bank digital currencies, borrow blockchain ideas. 
In our next episode, we'll zoom into mining operations. Those vast farms in Iceland or Texas, their tech and sustainability efforts. We'll compare Bitcoin to Ethereum, dissecting POS versus POW, and explore emerging applications like Web3 and Metaverses. If this excites you, smash that subscribe button, enable notifications, and drop a like to support the channel. In the comments, share. What blockchain aspect blows your mind most? What should we cover next? Perhaps DeFi risks or NFT controversies? Thank you for investing your time in this comprehensive dive into blockchain mechanics. If it resonated, share with a crypto curious friend. Description links include Bitcoin's white paper, free wallets, and educational sites like blockchain.com. Until next time, stay curious, explore responsibly, and I'll see you soon.